Welcome to the Perfectly Integrated Podcast, hosted by Matt Ackerman, where we show the power of teamwork in wealth management. Now, on to the show. Welcome back to the latest edition of Perfectly Integrated. I'm Matt Ackerman, the Chief Content Officer here at Integrated Partners, and I'm joined today for a really special conversation on compliance. Compliance is sometimes a necessary evil at some firms. Sometimes they're viewed as the bad guy. But at the end of the day, what is compliance? Why is it necessary? And more importantly, why are they kind of the guardian angels here at most uh, advisory firms? I'm joined today by Integrated Partners Chief Legal Officer, John Cataldo. John has been uh, my guardian angel more times than once since I joined Integrated back in October. And he has been kind of somebody that I've really started to understand compliance with. You know, I've spent so much of my career on the media side where anytime somebody said to me, we're going to have to run that through compliance, I'd roll my eyes, I'd get irritated. But at the end of the day, now that I'm on the inside looking out, I realize how critical a role it is. John, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for putting up with me for the past six months. No no problem on both accounts. Good talking to you again. Good talking to you, John. So, John, I have to be honest with you. In a lot of scenarios, compliance is viewed as the bad guys. So are you you the bad guys at these firms? Tell me about a little about the role of compliance and how critical it is for every advisory firm and really every advisor. Sure. Well, I'd like to hope that we're not the bad guy, right? I mean, we're we're oftentimes pitched that way because of the role that we play, which is, like you said, the guardian angel. We're, We're the angel on your shoulder looking over things, which means necessarily sometimes we're telling you, hey, that might not be such a good idea, or you might want to try it a different way. And that sometimes gets perceived as as the bad guy. Also, it's the approach, right? And And there's lots of different approaches to things in life. And and maybe the way some people go about it can, can have the approach that makes you feel like they're saying no when they're really saying not that way. So what's the role of compliance, right? Well, I guess you really just have to start with what's the industry that we're in, right? We're in the business of managing people's money, of assisting them with preparing for their future. And it's, it's a professional endeavor, just like doctors, attorneys, CPAs. We're in, we're in a noble profession. And people entrust us with their finances and with their well-being now and in the future. And and that relationship necessarily brings a tremendous amount of scrutiny from the government, right? And that scrutiny takes the form in our business of the Securities Exchange Commission, FINRA, and the state regulatory agencies that overwatch the things that we do right? And that's no different than any other profession, by the way. Attorneys have regulatory organizations that monitor them. The same with doctors, with ethical boards, the same with CPAs, you know, the same with the CFP board. So, you know, it starts there, okay? And then compliance is your internal liaison, your internal, you know, a Rosetta Stone that helps to interpret those rules and regulations assimilate them to the business practices that you engage in every day and help develop a program that allows you to comply with what the regulators want you to do, best practices of what you should do, and allow you to do it in a way that allows you to you know, to continue to conduct your practice. It's so interesting because I think where advisors get frustrated, at least the advisors I know, with compliance is this notion of um, hey, you can say that, you can't say this. You can say it this way, you can't say it that way. Where, where does it all come from? Where, what's, where, why um, are we so fine, especially around language, especially around marketing, so that we can protect advisors, but at the same time, allow them to innovate and stand out? Right. There's, there's a lot in that question. I start with, you know, you have to understand the relationship between the financial advisor and compliance. And it's it, it ideally, and it integrated, it's a collaborative relationship. It's a partnership, right? Financial advisors at their core are excellent asset managers and excellent asset gatherers, okay? But like I said, you've got all this regulation, got all these other organizations and entities that overwatch our business. And it's only a necessary evil that we have to you know, deal with those aspects of our business. And you could be at the largest wirehouse or the smallest single man RIA, 
the rules and regulations are the same and apply to all of us. So the benefit of having a compliance department is they're your partner. Their job is to understand those rules, to understand those regulations, to know what's happening, what's changing industry trends, and to help develop systems that will allow you to work in a compliant manner and to help you know, help you understand what, what your expectations are. So that's the first place, right? Is that it comes from a place of partnership, okay? It's an interesting partnership because you're dealing with entrepreneurial individuals, especially when you're in an independent RIA environment where the advisors are free to manage their assets the way that they feel is best for their clients, to manage their practice in a way that's efficient for them. You know, so if you look at it from that perspective, you know, the advisors come to us with all sorts of great ideas, but with a lack of appreciation many times of what some of those rules are and how they apply. So that's where the partnership comes in. And we take what the advisor wants to do and, and a really good compliance department will never say no. They'll say, how about we try this, right? And, and a really good compliance department won't just say, let's try this. They'll say, well, this is what the rule is. This is what the regulators are saying. This is how some other folks like you might have made a mistake in the past, and it cost them either in a regulatory action that's now permanently on their record or a fine or something. So you educate the advisor so that they understand that you're not just coming up with this in a vacuum, that you are really coming at it from a, from a, a position of knowledge and experience equal to their knowledge and experience. And in that partnership, you're recommending, let's try it this way, because it's going to meet your goal. And it's going to, you know, meet the regulatory obligations and all this overwatch that we have to deal with. So that's where the partnership comes into play. Now, you've probably seen it all in your years handling compliance issues. What's one, what's some of the dumbest mistakes that you've seen advisors make? You know, I would say there are no dumb mistakes. And it sounds silly to say that because of course you look back and you're like, why the heck did somebody do that? <laughs> but, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, let's push aside all the bad actors, the guys that are doing stuff because they're really, you know, um, not intent on doing the right thing in our business. And let's focus just on the ones that, you know, they're, 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 they're good people. They're trying to do the right thing in our business. And they're just not thinking about all of the collateral issues. And that's really where most of these challenges, most of these problems come from. It's, not really thinking through the problem, right? And, and in fact, most of the times where I've seen these quote unquote foot faults, these mistakes, it's because the advisor goes ahead and does something without engaging compliance, without engaging their partner and saying, hey, this is what I'd like to do, right? So, I mean, a great example of one, Sometimes you do something that you know is wrong, but you do it anyways. A great example of that would be, you know, a client signed a package of 15 documents and they missed one signature on one document, right? Well, maybe somebody affixes a signature to it. That's something that we all know is wrong, but sometimes an advisor does because they view it as a harmless violation, right? The client is obviously would have signed this had they known about it. It's in the client's best interest. It's just one document among many. Maybe it's even a very minor document. Like the client called you and said, you know, hey, would you mind giving me $25,000 out of XYZ account? I need it today to pay my kid's school. I don't have time to sign anything. Just send it to me. So they reuse a signature from an old distribution form. That's actually one of the most common ways this happens. Um, unfortunately, it's a big deal because even though it may be harmless, it's one of those obvious errors. Other errors aren't so obvious. And a lot of them center around marketing, especially social media. Social media is one of the most exciting parts, in my opinion, of the financial services industry because it's allowed us to communicate with clients and connect with clients in ways that we never could even 10 years ago. On the other side, it is the bane of my existence because social media is something that advisors engage in, not just in their professional life, they engage in it in their personal life as well. So when that line gets blurred and you're so used to picking up your phone and posting a picture of yourself in front of the Louvre in Paris, right? Sometimes you're also you know, familiar with, well, let me just post this idea I have 
about what's happening in the markets today. Maybe it's about uh, GameStop, right? To use something that's very contemporary and happening today. Well, you know, the problem is posting a picture in front of, in front of the Louvre and showing people how much fun you're having, right? There's no, you know, there's no concern there. There's no regulatory issue. But if you post an idea, a notion on social media that might be construed as a recommendation or as advice, well, that's something that could be a problem because it's not tailored to any particular person. It's not, doesn't have the right disclosures to ensure that, you know, it's giving a fair and balanced sort of idea. And, and the worst problem with social media, which is why it's really the bane of my existence, is it's a freebie for the regulators, right? And what do I mean by that? It's a freebie in as much as they don't have to come to the firm, to the RIA, and ask for documents and information. They don't need a client to email them a complaint and say, I'm unhappy about something. They can just search for certain words on the publicly available internet and then find something that they subjectively have a problem with and then you can't take it back it's out there forever wow now <laughs> i don't know how you keep track of all this of all these advisors of all these people i know you have a great team but but compliance is something that's evolving and moving i know that you know there's constantly regulatory changes going on i mean recently we had the new chair of the sec come in you know how, how do you think some of these changes, this new chair of the SEC, for example, how is that going to shape the tone of what uh, regulators are going to be doing, you know, say over the next year or so? Right. Another really good question. How is it going to impact what, what the regulatory landscape is? Mm -hmm. I think that every time there is a change in administration, first of all, that is the most central change because we are in a highly politicized industry. So the Securities Exchange Commission is an executive office. The commissioner is appointed by, well, the chairman is appointed by the president of the United States. So the agenda of the SEC is often set and the tone is set by the party that's in office. No surprise that in a, you know, in an, in an administration that is less focused on regulation, typically a Republican administration, you tend to see less enforcement, you tend to see less rulemaking. And that certainly is what happened during the Trump administration. During a, an administration that has a greater focus on regulation, on progress, particularly if there's, if there's a focus on the financial services industry, like in the Obama administration, you tend to see a focus on more regulation. And we're seeing that already in the SEC. You know, Gary Gensler, who is the new chairman, has a reputation. He had a reputation during the Obama administration of being one of the most proactive regulators in all of the administration. Doesn't matter if we're talking about financial services, environmental services, road construction. He was considered one of the most progressive regulators. He was the commissioner of the CFTC, which is a, a sister to the SEC. They, they regulate the futures industry. So, you know, being appointed as the chairman of the SEC certainly gives us a, a, an insight into the SEC's future over the next four years, and that it's going to probably, you know, enact more regulation, probably enforce more of its rules more stringently, and certainly be a more active regulator than we've seen in the, in the past four years. So with that in mind, if you're an advisor, what should you be doing now proactively so that you can stay ahead of the curve too and you know keep your firm and your business and your clients out of trouble. Right. So partner with compliance. Have routine conversations with them. When you're thinking of doing something new or novel, even if it's something that you don't think would be an issue, just ask, right? They're always going to have an idea for you. And again, it's that spirit of partnership. You know, just just earlier today, I had an advisor ask me a question that pretty simple and easy. He wanted to do business with a particular client and it was a planning situation, just purely financial planning. But this particular client works in the data security field and is very hypersensitive to giving out his data. Well, the client understood he has to give the advisor his name and his financial situation so that the advisor can provide him with quality financial planning services but he didn't want to give him his social security number. And that's one of the standard fields that we ask for on our account forms. So 
you know, I explained to the advisor because he said, well, how do I address this with the client? And, and I explained to him that, you know, well, first of all, in the spirit of accommodating the advisor, you know, that's a situation that we probably don't necessarily need the client's social security number. We're not opening an account. We're not managing assets. We're providing a financial plan. So in the planning context, you don't necessarily need that for AML concerns and things like that. But what I did was I, I, I helped the advisor build a relationship with the client by giving the advisor a word track, not just saying, sure, it's fine, no problem, don't get it. So you might want to share with your client why we asked for it. And the reason we asked for it is because, you know, we, we like to standardize our data across our different account forms. And if, we was, if he was opening a custodial account, we might need that. But, you know, help the client understand. And then by extension, the advisor now understands and the advisor is more prepared for that question in the future. So the advisor really could have simply just declined to assist the client or say, no, we really need that. But no, he, he chose to ask us the question and we were able to accommodate the client, accommodate the advisor, educate the advisor and, and you know, and help do the right thing for somebody. So, you know, I think that is a, that's a, that's just one example, but really it's that collaboration that matters. Collaboration is key. And it, you mentioned new and novel and you're working with entrepreneurs and always want to do something different. So I got a, a fun little game for us. A few things that advisors are talking to me about, about new and novel things they want to do. And I'm going to ask you now, is this a red flag or a green flag? You're going to throw a red flag up at us to stay away from this or a green flag we can keep going. All right. First it. and foremost, testimonials. This is something obviously the ad law changes have come into place. Testimonials, is it something advisors should have as a red flag right now or does green mean go? I'm going to go with yellow. How about okay. that? I love I'm going it. To change it up on you. So <laughs> right now it's a red flag. Testimonials are not permitted for registered investment advisors and investment advisor reps. And many people are duly registered, right? So that's not permitted under the current advertising rule. The SEC has recently adopted a new advertising rule that allows for testimonials and endorsements to be permitted client testimonials and endorsements in certain situations. That rule has been adopted, but it has not been enacted. It is not effective yet. So that's why it's a yellow card. The mm -hmm. reason it's also a yellow is because tread lightly, right? You, you The rule is really strict and it requires disclosure when you are using a testimonial and among the things that have to be disclosed is that whether the client is being compensated for the testimonial or whether it's a client or not a client and a few other things as well so again you have to be aware that that testimonial is something that has to be done a real specific way with really key disclosures so does it lend itself to a tweet probably not does it lend itself to something on a website where you can put the effective disclosures? Probably so when it's permitted, right? And always with the approval of compliance so that they can help make sure that we're complying with, with the rules and regulations as they exist today. Awesome. Next one for you, crypto and digital currencies. What do you think, red, green, or are you going to throw me a yellow again here? No, I'm going to throw a red flag on this one, okay? Okay. Um, this is an opinion red flag because there's no rule that re prohibits marketing materials or social media posts or things surrounding cryptocurrency. Why am I throwing a red flag? I'm throwing a red flag because it is white hot in this industry right now. Not just white hot with clients wanting to get in because they all think it's the next greatest thing. It's not just white hot with advisors because they want to be able to, you know, talk to their clients about new and developing trends and show that they are on the cutting edge of what's happening in our industry. It's, it's white hot because the regulators are all over it and they are not happy about it. Again, you use GameStop as a second example, even though that's not crypto. Crypto is the same thing. The high volatility, the fact that it is an unregulated marketplace, the fact that it is highly volatile, I uh, already said that, you know, that lends it to being something that is very dangerous. Because again, remember what I said earlier, whatever you post marketing wise, especially on the internet, can be seen by the regulators 
simply through word searches. And that's actually what they're doing. They're searching through the popular sites like Reddit and YouTube for posts that they want to evaluate and see whether or not people are making broad recommendations without effective disclosure and without properly dis you know, discussing how these different uh, market segments like cryptocurrency could help or hurt clients. Yep. So next up, as we stay in this white hot area, let's go over to cannabis. What do you, what are your feelings when folks want to discuss cannabis either through social media or on their website? What do you think? Cannabis is another one. It's a real challenge. Okay. Um, I still would throw a red flag on that because okay. again, we're talking about an industry that is growing, no pun intended. It's more developed than something like crypto. It's more regulated something like, than something like crypto. But the challenge with the cannabis industry is you've got state law, you've got federal law. And many states have decriminalized it. It is still a controlled substance under federal law. So that's actually, had, that's actually brought lots of challenges to our business, particularly around opening bank accounts, opening brokerage accounts for people that work in that industry. Are those considered gains from an illegal activity? I mean, what, regardless of what you feel about the industry itself, I'm just talking about from a law standpoint, that's been a challenge. And that has prohibited a lot of companies from working with people who uh, work in that industry. Then you've got the, 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 the real question for you know, the cannabis stocks and the cannabis ETFs and things like that and whether or not there's viability to them in the long term. That's an investment decision I don't get into. But when it comes to marketing, you should probably be cautious. I'm gonna throw a red flag on it, but I could convince to be yellow on that one. We've got a yellow, a red, a red that might be a yellow. Now I'm gonna throw something that's, <laughs> that's ironically gonna be green on the front end, but let's see if it stays green. And that's ESG and green investing. ESG regulation, something folks are talking about now. What's your feelings in ESG? So I'm going to throw a green on that one. We're going to keep green. We found a way to get green. The reason I'm going to go green on that one is because th there aren't as many regulatory issues. We're not talking about an industry that, whose regulation is in flux. We're not talking about something that's volatile. We're talking about a, a trend, right? It's a new trend to be more interested, to be more focused on ESG investing. And that is something that I think is squarely within the realm of what an advisor should be talking about and can effectively talk about in marketing materials without really having to worry much about you know running afoul of any of any of any rules regulations or or industry trends it's well, i've learned from my years once you get a green answer you stay that's it so that was that was a fun little game of red yellow green and you know i'm noticing a trend here and that is it's best to ask the question first. I think if there's one lesson I'm learning from this, it's you know it's, it's always better to stay ahead of the curve, to ask questions before you act. And I guess that's my big takeaway from this conversation is, is compliance is both art and science here a little bit, right? It's, there's no hard and fast line and it's about getting insights from you as the expert so that hopefully you know, advisors you know, can get more greens than they get reds and yellows. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I really think it's smart to look at it that way. There really is art and science to it because you've really, you know, the science is knowing what the rules are. The art is figuring out how to implement them, share them with the advisors effectively so that you understand, you know, how it impacts your practice. It's amazing. Well, John, it's been a great conversation. We end each conversation here on Perfectly Integrated the same way with a question from my nine-year-old son, CJ. So I told him a little bit about what we were talking about today, how you were the compliance expert. And CJ's question was very interesting. It was, is that what he wanted to be when he was growing up? So that's the question today for you, John. What did you want to be when you were growing up? Did you always want to be the chief legal officer at Integrated Partners? What was your dream when you were nine years old? When I was nine years old, what popular TV shows were things like Night Court and mm -hmm. Family Ties. Alex Keaton was a hero of mine, as was mm -hmm. Dan Fielding. So I always wanted to be a lawyer because I thought lawyers were hilarious. And Alex Keaton was a hero because 
I just thought it was really cool that he was always in a suit and the rest of his family was like these hippies. And he was like wheeling and dealing, even though he was like 15, 18 years old. Right. So I never thought I'd be the chief legal officer, but I always knew I'd be in business and I always wanted to be a lawyer. We'll see. It's always good when dreams come true. You know, I can hear now the night court theme playing in my head. Maybe we should do that. One of these episodes is just have the night court theme play us out. Well, whatever the case may be, John, this has been so much fun getting a chance to talk to you, getting a chance to learn. You know, you guys are the white hats. You're not the bad guys. You're definitely the folks keeping all of us out of trouble, including me. So, John, thanks so much for taking a chance to talk today. Thanks for your time today. Awesome. Content in this material is for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advice offered through Integrated Partners, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from LPL Financial.